Okay, it is great to see people coming in, chatting their hellos, and arriving at our meeting today. So why don't we why don't we jump right in? I want to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for coming together with us today. I'd like to remind you that if you prefer to hear this session in Spanish or in French, please use the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. We will be recording today's session and the recording will be made available on the CGIR info point within the coming days for any colleagues who are unable to join us live. If you encounter any difficulties, technical difficulties during the webinar, <clears throat> please write to staff-events at cgir.org. It's a new, uh, a new email address that we will put into the chat for everyone. Um, before I start, I just want to recognize that the times that we schedule for these webinars will not necessarily work for all of our staff around the world. We want you to know that we try to be considerate of the many time zones that staff live and work in alongside people's personal schedules and holidays and meetings. Uh, it's very difficult to land on good times for everyone. We do realize that this means that uh, some of, for some of you, it is quite early in the day, those in North and South America, or quite late in the day for colleagues in Asia. So we try to do our best to schedule so that people don't have to join outside of work hours or on national holidays, and we'll continue to make this effort. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize the tremendous ongoing work that's being led by the various disciplinary communities of practice, task teams and working groups who are regularly coming together across CGIR to innovate, to brainstorm, and to collaborate in just so many different ways. Um, in addition to thanking our colleagues for working on these critical initiatives, I'd also like to sincerely thank our colleagues for leading the employee-led resource groups. I hope you're aware of these groups and that you consider joining them. Those colleagues are collaborating to develop new data systems, those that are working on new and existing shared service projects, on our people and culture community who are working on multiple fronts to support us. Your passion and your commitment are recognized and truly appreciated. Now, as usual today, we have a very full agenda. So uh, while we do have a uh, space for question and answers today um, within our, our time frame, we also like to make additional space available for even much more focused dialogues on some of these key topics that are in process right now. I'm therefore pleased to say that we will be having a series of open webinars They'll soon be announced on a range of these workplace related topics. These will be held across multiple time zones, which hopefully will be convenient for all of you and in a very interactive way. I encourage you to watch out for those calendar invitations and to join Fiona and other senior leadership team members on those calls to get more in depth information on so many of the key issues that we're progressing. For today, we have 90 minutes and uh, several topics to cover. First, we will discuss the recent outcomes of the senior leadership team uh, after having met in Addis and the action plan that, it was, that was agreed as a result, how we intend to follow up. Second, we want to take a moment on the CGIR's food crisis response. Third, uh, to introduce our brand new advisory panel for stakeholder engagement. And finally, to address the changes to the one CGIR leadership structure. And for that item on the leadership structure, we will be joined by several members of the system board to discuss the board's decision and the underlying process. We'll also be answering your questions. Please post your questions in the webinar chat, or you can use the anonymous form link that is in the chat. We also have set aside time to take some questions live and uh, hope to go through these, uh, also the questions that we have uh, received ahead of time. We really appreciate when you do submit those questions ahead of time. So jumping right in, let me hand over to Elwyn to speak about the recent decisions that were made at the senior leadership retreat held in Addis uh, around our matrix structure. Over to you, Elwyn. Thanks, Claudia. <clears throat> um, 
first let's uh since it's mid-year let's take a quick stock take of 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 what we've done this year um and what we intend to do in the second half of the year so there's a slide that we shared with the council that we wanted to share um with this group and it really is is framed and driven by the senior leadership team retreat so if we can move on a slide um and the point here was just what incredible amount of work we've all done and we know how much time and energy that's taken because on top of building one CGIR, you know, we're delivering on our existing um, commitments and priorities. So we really appreciate, and I know we say this every meeting, what a lift this has been. Um, it's really important to recognize just what that's achieved so far. Um, often when you're in change, it feels like it's going on uh, for an infinite amount of time. But when you look back, you think what an incredible amount we achieved over, over a number of years. And I really think this will be the same. If we look at what we've done the first half of this year, um, the initiatives were approved and launched. It was just excellent work. Um, we have a really intensive set of engagements that we've spoken about in past meetings. And, and, and uh, when Lucas will speak about in a moment, the high level panel, a new performance management approach was rolled out. Um, the, uh, the integration framework agreement concept has been launched um, to, to, to really try and create the, uh, a, a clearer enabling environment for this to move forward. Um, we have a detailed operational structure and made a lot of progress on phase three and four recruitment. Um, incredible work done by the um, HR community of practice. I have to say, actually, all communities of practice in all of this. Um, SLT have met twice. We've agreed an integrated matrix structure. I'll come to that. Um, we've launched a, um, a really significant diagnostic work on integrated business services. We've got fin plan approved. Country conveners were appointed. Um, the, the detailed culture diagnostic um, has been nearly completed and a staff survey uh, has been done. Um, we have a revised uh, GDI framework. We have a food crisis response plan. The list is longer than that. So really just to say it's an incredible lift uh, what, what's been done. Uh, and we thank everyone for that. Um, over the second half of the year, and again, non-exhaustive list, um, we do need to update our transition plan. Um, there was a, a plan produced last December that needs updating in light of the, uh, the, the integrated matrix structure that, that we've developed. Um, we need to carry on with the global regional country engagement and deepen that. We need to um, uh, complete some thinking and, and, and launch advisory arrangements around the science groups. The integration framework agreement involving board um, center boards and the system board um, needs to be prepared and, and hopefully agreed. Um, there are various priority policies and procedures we need to work on. Um, we need to complete the phase three appointments and make good progress on, on some of the phase fours. We have a whole new fin plan to update, develop um, for next year. Um, there's an initiative to develop. Um, there's a food crisis response plan to implement as rebranding on its way around CGIR and work on the globally integrated business services. And of course, um, continuing implementation of the first year of the initiatives, that startup has been excellent and all the other work we're doing. So it's a, gonna be a busy second half of the year as well, um, but we've, we've done brilliantly in that first half. Let's go to the next slide. So that was just a bit of recognition for what's been done and um, what lies ahead. Um, now on the matrix structure, um, we had a really good retreat um, with the senior leadership team, which actually includes um, all the all the members of the operate of the management of the operational structure, the inter, um, and and DGs, um, and many most wearing 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 dual hats in that process. So it really encompasses the whole of CJR um, at the executive level. And and what what we agreed was was it was a way to weave together. Um, all the capabilities of CJR that that, re that that really truly recognizes the the host country agreements and the the importance of of, of keeping center capabilities and capacities strong, um, and yet at the same time finds a way that we empower um, the the uh, those those staff leading the the global groups those leaders of the global groups to deliver on the the commitments we've made about delivering integrated science. Um, about deliver, delivering integrated business services around a better, more coordinated fundraising effort, um, the same on communications and um, global, regional, and particularly country engagement. Um, so 
we, we met in April, we agreed to meet again to, to, to come back and, and really flesh that out. I made a lot of progress at the last retreat that was shared in, in an email to all staff. So we, we believe we've got something that can work here. <clears throat> um, it's defined over the business plan period as something that we think will make a step change towards a more coherent and more coordinated or integrated CGIR, whichever word we choose to use here, as a as really a, a clear pathway to one CGIR. Um, and let me give a couple of examples if we go to the next slide, because we appreciate this can come across as a little sky high, but it has real meaning for, for all of us because it's encompassing the whole of CGIR, all the set, all the, the CGIR centers, the system organization, the alliance, um, and of course the whole operational structure. So the three types of reporting lines that that, that staff will have. Um, for the vast majority of, of, of our staff, um, they will continue with a single reporting line into a manager um, in, the, in their center. Um, they, they, they will, that, that will not change. They'll continue, and the example we give here is, for example, a gene bank technician. Um, they'll continue to, to report into a, a manager um, in their center. That manager may have, may or may not have a dual reporting line, depending on where they are in the, the center structure, and I'll come to that. Um, but their, their reporting relationship will continue. They will be part of the gene banks department in the genetic innovation global group, which will help bring them together as part of a greater whole. Um, and with that, we, we anticipate, you know, more and more incentives for strong teamwork and common ways of working um, across, for example, gene banks, of which actually great progress has already been made um, um, in, in the past. And, they'll, and they will continue or be, contribute to bilaterally funded projects and or pooled funded initiatives. So um, they'll, they'll be part of a number of, of projects or programs. So that's the vast majority of staff. Um, um, but then we have some, if we go to the more senior levels, a, a senior director, to be defined, right? Um, in say, for example, RAFs in one of the science groups, they may have a, a dual reporting line to a center DG and a science group, um, a global director um, or managing director. The senior, um, the senior scientist, um, you know, they, they, they will be working on a number of, 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 of initiatives possibly, or one initiative. Um, and so actually we see them participating in the development and building a, a global science group um, and maybe leading or participating in a, in a CGR initiative, but also working very closely with their, their center DG in continuing to develop um, center, um, center bilateral projects. That's really important. Um, um, so in a, in a sense, that's why it's dual. And that's, that's something we'll need to manage very carefully. Um, and, and that, that reporting line to the DG helps ensure business continuity on, 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 on very critical functions around overseeing delivery of bilaterally funded work. In some cases, and this is an even smaller number, there'll be single reporting line to the, to the global group, and it won't be a dual line operationally with a, um, a center DG. Um, and that, for example, um, could be uh, in people and culture, where we need a director for gender diversity inclusion. Um, and if we don't have that capability in, in CGIR to, for, to, to source that with an internal staff member, um, we, we would need to go look externally for that, for that person. And that wouldn't be a person who's fulfilling a specific center um, uh, based role at the same time. There are a handful of these positions. Um, we, we select them very carefully. Um, because in those cases, there is an additional cost, but this is an additional huge benefit of something we must do. Of course, an individual such as this case will be based in a, in a center, the system organization and the alliance, we haven't decided exactly where in this case, um, who would be their employer as record, as would be the case in, in all of these. So I hope that gives a little bit more detail and, 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 and um, and specificity to, to, to the concept that we're developing. Um, we really do need to meet again as, as, a, as a senior leadership team, which just so wonderfully brings together um, the whole of CJR and, and work through some more of the details on this. But we believe now we have a, 
a model which we think can work, it can deliver, and we can really move forward more swiftly into the implementation phase. So um, at this point, I believe I hand over to Hulud. There's a pause there. Um, Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So, but the, the light turned off, so I had to put it back on. Sorry, the sensors. Uh, well, thank you, Elwin. And uh, while uh, thinking about the reflections I wanted to share, actually, I thought to share not necessarily from what happened in the room. And I think uh, Elwin summarized some of it. And of course, in the communication, you received a lot. But I find really most of my reflections were from outside the room and, and from the, the, the visits, the walks, the meeting different people uh, across the campus, uh, meeting with the scientists, visiting the gene bank, uh, talking with different people, breaking bread and, and even making bread in Jira with, uh, with some. Um, the, the SLT retreat itself, I would say it was like four days um, intense. We had ups and downs. We had tense moments. We had aha moments. We had uh, times where we felt we were getting close. We get things done. Um, uh, but I think collectively, we we ended up uh, at the end feeling we, we made progress and we have a path forward to something very complex. Uh, but as I mentioned, my reflections are from a little bit outside, which is the first one is um, especially for me, this was my first visit to a CG uh, campus um, and somebody who's external to CG and I did not come from a center. Uh, so for me, this trip and being on campus um, and seeing how it looks like to be an integrated organization and have presence um, was really, really fascinating uh, for me, especially when, when, when you're part of something complex, something very, very hard. You, you, sometimes it's very hard to imagine what the destination looked like. Um, and going and seeing something real existing gives you a sense that it is possible and it's actually reality. Uh, we just need to, to build on it. And that's how I felt when I was walking around and seeing, oh, this is F3, this is SIP, um, uh, uh, etc. It was really nice to see this. It's a reality. It's not just a dream. It's not just a fascination. Uh, so that was one of my first reflections, uh, going around and seeing it as a, as a reality. The second reflection comes from a conversation I had with the IT team there, who absolutely did a fabulous job. I was really impressed with how seamless the event went. It was a hybrid um, it was seamless. We had Wi-Fi across campus. Um, and when I met with the team and I kind of really uh, wanted to learn about, you know, their day-to-day, -day, how they really managed to support people from all, almost the centers. And it was interesting. Something stuck with me that one of the, of the barriers, one of the areas that really make them feel, oh, we could really do better is when they need to support somebody, it's not necessarily elderly staff, um, is sometimes it takes time to coordinate, to refer to the uh, technology team team where, where this uh, uh, person comes from, and that makes them feel they delay. They, they're not really delivering the quality of the service they would love to uh, if they were given uh, kind of a more of an integrated approach or having visibility in, in the setup or if we had a little bit more harmonized uh, technology. And for me, that was kind of something I took away and started imagining what if we have a, a digital profile that you carry with you wherever you go around the world and whenever you are in a in a center in a campus uh, that digital profile is available for the IT team to support you to to, to work with you um, and that was an, another kind of reflection the third one is really uh, visiting the gene bank and and she's seeing and touching the uh, the genome series of the chicken um, and hearing about all the fascinating work it really brought it a lot home and, and reminded us that we're all really part of um, something quite meaningful and quite impactful. Uh, and it gave me, honestly, despite the challenge with, with change and with transformation and how you really move forward, reminded us with really the big purpose that, that we all have. Um, uh, and that's why I kind of, I, I came back with, with really more energy to really proceed and, and continue to, uh, insisting that we have to make it work because this work is very, very important and impactful. And I'm going to always remember uh, that story that we heard at the, at the gene banks and the, um, and the meetings with the scientists. Um, the final reflection, I just will quickly share it uh, and then hand it to Isam to share his, is I started hearing uh, 
coining a new terms of how we refer to things within our CG uh, culture. The first one is, is that digital and data is sticking with people. It was funny that um, when we moved with a new name uh, to have data, um, that people now uh, and the SLT team started reminding me whenever I said digital services, they will remind me that it's digital and data now. Um, but also there started to be a term uh, of the business partners, uh, referring to um, the, the, the groups, the, the digital, the business operation, etc., uh, rather than just corporate services or service providers, which I think is an important shift in how we really look at our roles and how we really all um, contribute and, and uh, are part of, uh, of driving um, this work. Um, also the word of integration rather than centralization. Um, it, it means a lot, and it was there was a number of integration stories that the SLT members shared, and it was fascinating that some people see centralization and integration as the same, and I see them very, very different, because when you integrate, you're bringing the best and the strongest from all pieces, and you harmonize them together. Uh, so I think that was another reflection, um, and also the development of a new metaphor, rather than we're building the plane while flying it, which I know it's terrifying for many people. I don't think any of us will step on a plane plane if it's being built. Uh, but the metaphor that we're building a train and we're building a new carriages in that train um, give me, gave me kind of a, a very interesting metaphor to think about that we're continuing to build, we're continuing to add, we're continuing to learn, and we're continuing to pave the road for this destination of the train because it's not just about the train itself, it's also about the, the, the road ahead and the, uh, the railroad that we're going to take to reach our destination. Um, so that all, if, if I would say, those reflections allowed me to go back and um, we came back to uh, moving forward with the global integrated business uh, system diagnosis so we can really identify more the needs and the priorities um, and continuing to unpack what does this mean for the team to deliver their global uh, services and high quality solutions moving forward. Uh, and I'm going to hand it to Assam to share his reflections from, uh, from the few days we spent in Addis. Shukran Khulud. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah I just introduced myself quickly. My name is Isam Yassin Mohammed. I'm the Interim Director General of World Fish, but also the Acting Senior Director for Aquatic Food Systems. Uh, I also have been given the privilege or the opportunity to uh, share my perspective on the SLT retreat in Addis. But first and foremost, uh, let me express my huge thanks and gratitude to our colleague and friend, Jimmy Smith and the Illwish staff uh, for making our stay in Addis more, more enjoyable and memorable. Well, I must say some did better than others. Some collected trophies for whoever baked the best injera and brew the best coffee, etc. But nonetheless, it was really wonderful for all of us. Um, and as, as Khulud said, of course, you know, the discussions were very collegiate, uh, but at times tense and ought to be tense uh, sometimes, because as we all know, it changes always hard. Um, change is always hard, uh, I think, partly because I believe as human beings, you know, we have this inherent need to not just stay afloat, but to thrive. And that also the inherent need to harness opportunities that the change process presents as well. So I think on a positive note, I think that's natural that, you know, we uh, have this tense environment sometimes, but I think in general, I think very collegiate environment and that need sort of, you know, how do we thrive uh, um, all together collectively? Um, I also want to uh, reassure one of my takes from the discussions that we had as well as we could hopefully reassure colleagues as well as the discussion that we had primarily focused on. It was central to staff well-being as well and stability. Um, it was very humbling to hear from a number of colleagues who were in the room who were asking oneself and challenging each other and saying that, what do I tell my colleagues on Monday morning? Or how do I insulate my staff or my colleagues from additional burden, et cetera, et cetera. I think all these were central to discussion, you know, it was the staff well-being and stability was really at the core of the discussion. Um, and as a result of that, as Elwin mentioned earlier, for instance, the 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 need to avoid parallel having parallel structures but also the need to have single jobs um, or jds or kpis etc i think all that was because there was this need that makes sure the staff well-being 
um, you know, is improved or not compromised during the change process. And I found that extremely comforting personally. But also I think there was a just genuine desire in terms of when it comes to accountability to our stakeholders as well. For instance, to our donors, you know, how do we deliver in a, in a more cost effective manner? For instance, having a consolidated you know, systems across the CJR, how would that create opportunities for cost effectiveness, for instance, you know, uh, genuine desire to remain accountable in that space, but also for our communities we work with as well. Just to give an example for me personally, having a number of interesting conversations uh, to talk beyond fish, as someone coming from all fish or from the aquatic systems, you know, uh, building on the work that we've been doing with Erie on fish rice systems, for instance, were excellent ideas that were emerging, talking to uh, Brown from Semit, at least in previous conversations, as well that led to some joint seminars recently as well, and talking to Ilri similarly, or with water, which quite interesting, I remember telling Mark Smith from uh, IME, that I cannot exist without you, essentially, in the water, and fish can't exist without water. So I think as we think about what we deliver to our communities, that desire to think beyond what we produce as one commodity, but to look at the plate and as people eat and to think about you know, how we can deliver, for instance, from world fish side, beyond fish, but how do we do fish and potato or rice and wheat, etc. So a lot of opportunity in that space as well, that personally, I've never had that opportunity to have that sort of perspective and to have that in-depth conversation with colleagues, but also accountability to governments, particularly alignment with national strategic priorities, et cetera, all these things were mentioned. So the sheer desire to remain accountable to our stakeholders was really, really uh, humbling. <clears throat> uh, well, another point is the consensus on the need to harness these opportunities and thrive together while fully complying with um, the central constitutions, host country agreements, et cetera, which I'm sure sends you know, the right signals to our staff, but also to our stakeholders out there. It was really great and wonderful. The reaffirmation of that was really good. Um, from Wolfish side, just before we conclude perhaps, there's the Wolfish side. I guess we are the easier bit of the puzzle because we benefit from that wholesale um, sort of fitness in the operational structure of the 1CJR. Um, but uh, hopefully, I think other colleagues will also find sort of, you know, the metric structure as accommodating as uh, possible for the rest of us as well. I mean, yeah, change is a process. It's a journey. Um, I, I believe we have clarity on the destination. So, you know, therefore, we'll continue to work together on the how the avenues that we take, the pace of the journey, enhancing you know, and um, ensuring there is um, minimal disruption to our business and make our canoe or boat sail uh, smoothly. And I just want to leave you with um, a, a line from uh, Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi, who is commonly known as Rumi in the Western world, who says, water in the boat is the ruin of the boat, but water under the boat is its support. So what we collectively were trying to do and we continue to do is to remove as much water as possible from the boat and have more water underneath to buoy us up all together. Um, I think that sort of is my general reflection um, of honestly of uh, uh, positivity and optimism as we embark in this journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Esam Mohammed, and I understand we needed greater introductions, who is our uh, Senior Director for Aquatic Systems and also our DG of World Fish. Thank you to Hulud Oda, who is our Global Director for Digital and Data, and also the Executive Director of the Systems Office. And of course, Ellen Granger-Jones, our Managing Director for Institutional Systems and Strategies. It was a very important meeting that we have just had uh, the readout on. And what I, what I hope you are all hearing is real progress, a real focus uh, forward on making things work and impact, all with a real focus as well, uh, sharp concern for the well-being of our staff and colleagues, recognizing how prolonged change is challenging, uh, 
but we're really moving forward and uh, doing what we can. We will have these people and culture follow-up events where many more of your in-depth questions can be answered. And we look forward to as many of you being able to join those and have those important conversations uh, moving forward. But now trying to keep the schedule, we are going to move on to a brief word on the uh, system council meeting that was recently held and importantly, the food crisis response, which is quite exciting and being prepared. So a few highlights of the meeting with the system council. First, um, we really found that the system council meeting was extremely timely because the global food crisis makes it painfully clear why CGIR is needed and why we need to work more closely together, together across the range of our capabilities to effectively respond to a crisis of this magnitude and breadth. Secondly, at the system council meeting, following a strong call in March for us to broaden and deepen our engagement with key stakeholders, particularly in the global south, our council members expressed their appreciation for all of the efforts that have been made since. Colleagues from Nigeria and from the African Development Bank were particularly uh, vocal in appreciating how CGIR has listened to stakeholders and adaptively managed the transition in response to the feedback that we've received. But you'll also be hearing later today how we are continuing launching the high-level panel and continue to be committed to that ongoing engagement, <clears throat> that conversation, which will allow us to adaptively manage to the, the journey we all need to take together. Uh, finally, thirdly, on the transition, the council reaffirmed its commitment to one CGIR. The council members appreciated the way in which the matrix structure can make visible the role of centers as the essential building blocks of CGIR but the importance of how the global and regional groups will help us weave across our centers, weave together for greater impact. So we will continue our work with the senior leadership team to operationalize the matrix while keeping the council informed and continuously engaging with our partners and stakeholders. But I think uh, perhaps the most in-depth conversation that we had was around the food crisis response. So I will now hand over to Yo Swinnen uh, to talk us through that. Yo, please. Thanks very much, Claudia. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to have you, to be with you here and to give you an update on, on where we are on our response to the uh, global food crisis. Um, we have made a lot of progress since we last met on this. Uh, we moved from our early work where we're analyzing markets, global impacts, um, to uh, and uh, had a loose set of the ideas of how the, the global the CGIR as a whole could come in and contribute to that to a much clearer package, I think a much more comprehensive package of what we can offer bringing the whole CG capacity together. And I definitely want to thank everybody for their inputs in uh, making this work over the past couple of weeks. Um, I, uh, next slide, please. The, um, so briefly, just it's important to set the frame, I think, to understand very much what we can contribute here. So this is a slide where I'm trying to summarize the global food security in what I call CCC times, conflict, COVID, climate change. And as you see on the right hand panel, all of these three are major contributors to uh, the food crises that many people are facing in the world today. So these are more extreme indicators compared to the hunger more broadly, uh, which is increasing since the middle of last decade. Okay, And so it's really a crisis effects on top of a structural change which has been taking place, a negative structural change. And then if we look at indicators of malnutrition more broadly in terms of healthy diets, the situation is much worse. About 3 billion people who cannot afford a healthy diet. Our food systems are importantly contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. And about a third of our food is lost or wasted um, throughout the system. So these are major structural problems linked, interlinked with, with the crisis situation. Next slide, please. If you look back over the past... Um, Essentially, for the 21st century, these are the price evolutions for the food, uh, for fuel, and for fertilizer. And what do we see? I mean, when we talk about, we keep talking about the 2007 2008 situation as a food price shock, okay? Shock means you move away from a stable situation, an unexpected development. What we see now, the, the, the normal is instability, it shocks, it's volatility, okay? And that has major implications, how we have to think about our food systems, how we have to think about the policy response to our food systems and the investments that need to take place. 
Next slide, please. The, um, so that has key implications for the, the response in general and the role of the CGIR in this response. And here I have summarized this by saying, well, what we've seen, and this is very, this came out of our discussion with system council members as well. So we are facing a global crisis. So that means we need a global solution and the CGR is a global organization. We need a systems approach to respond to a systems crisis. We cannot only respond in, with uh, better policies, better technologies, better management structure. We need all of that and we need to integrate. And of course, the systems approach is an essential part of our uh, CGR structure for a uh, CGR um, strategy for the next uh, decade. And we need both short-term responses to the current crisis, but we also need medium-term responses and long-term response. That clearly comes out of, of the analysis, which I just summarized. I mean, solving the Ukraine issue right now is not gonna solve the more fundamental, the more structural issues that we're facing. And so all of this reinforces, I think, the transformation, the resilience agenda, and the need to invest structurally in global solutions. And that brings immediately the CGIR straight into the center of the action, I think. Our current, our 2030 research and innovation strategy fits very well in this thing. It has all the elements, I think, to address it. And our current uh, portfolio of initiatives, which is really the implementation phase of the overall strategy, fits very well, I think, in this as well. But, of course, that's not enough. I mean, people want more of us. Also, System Council, the funders, want more of us. And so we have, in the short run, we have been, I think, leading a lot of the analyses, a lot of the, the, the policy work as well globally. And at the same time, now we are proposing a set of seven innovation area package. Next slide, please. I cannot in, uh, yes, so this is just a summary of the uh, short-term uh, action that we have done in terms of our analysis and basically engaging with global stakeholder, global policymakers, global media as well. And I think it's been very much uh, appreciated. There's been a lot of attention to our work. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the seven areas, okay? I have actually seven slides where I go to, which identify each of these in, in detail. I think uh, the, the translators will not survive my presentation if I go into details on this and I would run over time. So what I'm gonna do here is go briefly through each of these seven points, but just for your information, people are interested. We have summarized these, we have developed these in more details. Happy to share these with you. The first two are really things we are doing very much already now. It's real-time monitoring, early warning system, developing indicators, tracking systems, what's going on. We are using our global and our local models to analyze the market situation, to draw policy uh, uh, implication, to analyze how different policies would affect the outcome. I think there the issue is to basically organize this into a food, in, well, sorry, more broadly into a crisis unit, if you want, and do this more structurally so that we don't have to draw on whatever we may have available already, but really develop it in a structural um, set of, of skills, of capacities, of instruments that we can draw upon going forward for crisis situations in the future. The third uh, innovation has to do with is specifically focused on fragile systems. We know that conflict and fragility is an really core component of the problems that we're facing now and particularly on the on the crisis situation and so this is an initiative which was already scheduled to become an element of our uh, uh, basic of our portfolio going forward and this is now central i think to uh, what we offer here as well so it it does a lot of different things it has early warning systems it has a set of innovations that take place institutional innovations uh, organizational innovation, technology innovation, but specifically focused on these fragile systems. Um, seeds are a really important element. And so our colleagues from uh, GI have put together, I think, a very um, attractive proposition. It links to work which is already planned under the market intelligence, the accelerated breeding and the seed equal uh, uh, initiatives, which are already taken, but really go beyond and both in the very short run, focusing on the rapid multiplication dissemination, and then in the medium run, focus more on faster, more resilient uh, development and delivery of market demanded uh, varieties. Okay, I think it's a, it's a very strong proposal there. The fifth has to do with management, crisis response management, and that goes across a lot of the work which is planned or organized or the capacity we have to do in, mostly in the RAFs area there. And so it applies to the crops, to the livestock and the aquatic food systems. And so there's a whole set of, of innovations that can, take, player, uh, can play, take place there or can be scaled up as well. 
The sixth one is really a very, an, a very important one, a very central to, to the current crisis, which is the, the shortage of fertilizer, very high fertilizer price. And I think here CGIR can really play an important role. There's a lot of work on this already going on, I think in our excellence in agronomy initiative, more efficient use of fertilizer, alternative ways of, of fertilizing, of create enhancing soil fertility. And there's a lot of really exciting uh, opportunities there. I think there's also a big policy component a lot of the subsidies going to fertilize right now are not very efficiently, so we have to rethink those. And the last point here is strengthening our um, national, um, not so much our national, but our collaboration, our engagement with national partners. And so obviously, if we really want to have impact at scale, we have to do this. This links with the regional integrated initiatives, obviously, because that's where we really adjust what we want to do to the specificities of the region, the specific demands also there and so they can play an important role coming in to make that uh, our work more relevant at the same time more demand driven and obviously more impactful we have this so i'm going to leave it at this i just want to add that i think the the council response was very appreciative both at the work we are already doing and the fact that we have now come up with an integrated proposal there were a number of suggestions for improvements for example is that you have to have more more emphasis on gender for example and so this is work in progress. We are trying to build in uh, these elements, certainly. And, uh, but I think the crucial part is that uh, the funders were excited that they could take this also to their national organization, international organization to make uh, a strong case for CGI support, I think. And since then, we've had follow-up presentations related to the Global Alliance for Food Security, related to the G7, to the United Nations Global uh, Crisis Response uh, Organization there and to a number of other organizations. So I think that there's a lot of uh, interest in what we're proposing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yo. Uh, the presentation on, on our food crisis response, I think was extremely well received as, as Yo was saying by the system council and by our partners. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate what the whole of system can deliver and frankly, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to position ourselves to make clear how we can make an impact immediately. That uh, while we are a research organization, we're also an organization that can be turned to in times of crisis for real-time impact on the ground. And that's, uh, that's very exciting. It should be exciting to all of us who are part of CG to know the role that uh, our analytics and our technical assistance, our technology innovations and partnerships are playing in response to the, uh, to the food crisis. So thank you, Yo. Um, we'll move now to Juan Lucas Restrepo, who will speak to us about the launch of the new high-level advisory panel. Juan Lucas, over to you. Uh, thank you, Claudia, uh, and it's great uh, to be here uh, talking to the to our global uh, CGIR community. Uh, if you put the slides up, uh, please. Uh, I would like to share uh, an effort uh, led by the whole uh, SLT uh, aimed at ensuring that uh, the CGIR reform is also about deepening our already rich relationships with uh, with the uh, and social capital with stakeholders and partners, but also acknowledging that we need to do a lot better in many domains, that we still there's still room to be, become a more demand driven and to make sure that we deliver on our 2030 strategy with, for, and through partners, which is one of the elements that hopefully you've had a chance to read in the foundational engagement framework for partnerships and advocacy that, that is there. So what, what the SLT has come up with, with the support of our, our global group, is three action tracks on a short-term engagement a action plan that have to do, as Claudia mentioned, with an empowered high-level advisory panel that the system board uh, put together uh, with uh, our support. It's about accompanying that in parallel with already ongoing, but uh, more country tailored uh, consult and regional consultation action plans uh, that use initiatives and listening sessions and making sure that through the second semester, we have our ears wide uh, open and, and, and really listening to, uh, to partners 
to ensure we calibrate with the support of the panel this engagement framework and use it to guide our engagement going forward. So if we move to the next slide, please. One very central piece of, of this plan is the launch of the high level advisory panel that was inaugurated last Monday. And it's a, a panel that's independent and will establish a set of dialogues, some internal uh, with, with CGIR across centers and the operational structure, some external with countries, with partners, with different typologies, uh, not, not only NARS, but private sector, academia, uh, civil society, et cetera, to make, to make sure we listen uh, and, and the panel helps us uh, listen and, uh, and reflect and advise uh, then on how we work on partnerships for impact, uh, about ownership, shared learning, uh, et cetera. And uh, also as an outcome uh, of, of this to review our engagement, uh, our proposed en engagement framework and help us uh, and help the EMT and the system board and all of us with guidance on strategies, approaches, and what needs to be best practice for the operation, operationalization of, of the framework and really deepening on our engagement. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we were, I feel very successful uh, in bringing together a, a panel that uh, is, is very special in its nature. Uh, it, we have uh, the honor to have a Umalele and Namanga Nongi that I hope uh, you, you know, as they are, have been very relevant uh, in our field, uh, having uh, worked as Namanga uh, with the system, very closely with the system, with the SRG uh, uh, lately, and UMA that has accompanied and, and, and written even about uh, CGIR change processes in, in the past. And this panel is accompanied by a, a great a group of people. We got a, a couple of ministers of agriculture, uh, Geraldine Mukeshimana, the minister of agriculture of, of Rwanda, as well as Muhammad Abdul Razake, the minister of agriculture of Bangladesh, which is critical because that, uh, you know, uh, leadership and, and political dialogue and, and understanding entry points through formal uh, government uh, representatives is going to be critical. We got great uh, other independent members such as Ji Kung Wang and Julio Verdegue that also bring very specific experience and knowledge uh, in, into the panel. And then we have a very interesting and important set of uh, panelists that uh, are basically this executive secretaries or leaders of regional fora that coincide with the regions uh, CGIR it operates in. So we have FARA, we got APARI, et cetera, it, making sure that connection and those, those networks it can be leveraged, as well as uh, Hildegard Lignon, last but not least, who's currently the Executive Secretary of GIFAR, the Global Forum for Research and, and Innovation. So this is the panel. And uh, as, as I told you before, we got great expectations on how they will help as deepening our engagement. And I want to finish on with the last slide, uh, saying a couple of things. First, we're not starting from scratch. This is a continuum, CGIR through its centers, through it, its system. We've built great social capital. And in, and, and in, in the recent times, we've deepened uh, this engagement. So you see, for example, how Temina, uh, our regional director in South Asia, uh, managed to get uh, together three very important country consultations in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, uh, where we learned a lot in, in very different countries, very different uh, political and, and cult cultural contexts. And this learning, of course, is critical for the ongoing uh, engagement that will take uh, forward. So thanks, Temina. I'm sure you are around uh, for, for that leadership. But we also have held uh, meetings in Latin America, in Madagascar, and a very important one uh, that was related to Africa in, in Abidjan, where with AFDB, the African Union, FARA, the regional economic uh, commissions, there is also work uh, uh, directed on at how we deepen 
this uh, important uh, dimension of engagement of, of CGIR. So many things going on, stakeholder engagement is absolutely critical for our system to thrive, to grow sustainably with for and through partners and with stakeholders having great clarity on our direction of travel and with also very clear entry points so we can listen to their needs systematically. This is it from me, Claudia, back to you. Thank you so much, Juan Lucas. And it's uh, it's so essential that we bring these voices in, that we hear them clearly. We truly understand them and can move forward. We have a question now. Um, we have just a few minutes till the top of the hour. A question now for Fiona on our people and culture. If I may ask Fiona, what is CG doing in terms of organizational policy to ensure that implementing the various projects are closer to the beneficiaries. Having more locations in areas where farming and fishing takes place against being stationed in the big cities. Over to you, if you would, Fiona. Oh, I'm sure, Claudia, that, that, is that the one for me around beneficiaries? Um, that was the one that popped up for me to pro provide you. Sorry, let me ask you a different one. No. Let me answer that while I'm asking you <laughs> a different one. Um, Fantastic. The expectation, frankly, is that we, we will not be centralizing staff. The strength, as we all know, of the CG is our global footprint and our sustained partnerships in the field. So the construct of 1CG and the integration and the reforms shouldn't have a significant geographical impact on where our capacities lie. But Fiona, exactly. The question that is for you is whether you could give us a couple of minute update on where we are in terms of the phase three recruitment process, if you would, Fiona. Lovely, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really pleased. I know we've only got a couple of minutes. But thanks for the opportunity because uh, we'll be able to go into it in a lot more detail in the coming weeks in the series of, of PNC webinars. Um, as a reminder to those colleagues who've reached out about um, for updates on phase three, you'll remember that phase three involves the recruitment and the appointment of people into the positions in the new operational structure that will report into the global groups. So I'm, I'm really happy to share that so far, 39 of, of the 54 phase three positions have been advertised. That's around 72%. Uh, we continue to have significant interest in, in these roles internally, which confirms what we all already know, which is we have amazing talent in-house. And it's fantastic uh, that we're uh, going to have the opportunity to retain and, and to pivot and, and to continue to allow that amazing talent um, to, to continue to do what they do in these leadership roles. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved in, in going through this um, very transparent and, and fair process and getting us to the point where we now have um, uh, preferred candidates for 27 of these 39 roles. Um, we're in the final stage of seeing global directors have discussions with centre director generals and the staff members themselves to finalise the transition arrangements. As you can imagine, the majority of these roles are being filled internally, and we really want to make sure that we empower the individuals to, to um, get off into these roles and get a good start in these new roles but also to make sure that we have a strong focus on business continuity um, in centres and to make sure that our centres continue to be the really strong uh, operating grounds that they are. Um, so um, the discussions that are happening at the moment um, are also um, seeing those hiring managers engage with those great internal candidates who were not successful in these applications and having those important discussions with those staff on career pathing and making sure um, that they're aware that not only are they extremely valuable, um, but that uh, to have those discussions about how they can contribute and continue to grow in the organization. So I know in many cases, those conversations have already taken place. Uh, some of them are ongoing. And um, once um, we get through the next uh, round of discussions, 
with our centre director generals and our global directors and really look forward to being able to release um, the information on those successful candidates in batches, I think. We don't want it to delay too much further. I've got a minute or two left and, and I would just like to, to share um, what the overall vision of those, uh, those 27 candidates look like. Um, I'm really happy to share that we have reached our 40% uh, diversity target uh, in terms of gender. So we're, we're at 41% at the moment. Uh, we're seeing 15 different nationalities being represented with about 59% uh, from the global south and uh, from across 11 different centers at the moment. And as you can see, we're continuing to fill those, those last roles. Um, I'm going to run out of time. So thanks so much for the opportunity to give that very high level update um, and looking forward to going into a lot more detail in the upcoming uh, webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you to all of the PNC teams. It's a, a very challenging job to try to move ahead with recruitments while ensuring business continuity, given the, the nature of our internal hires, this weaving together of our global talent pools. So thank you very, very much, you and your colleagues. We'll move now to our last uh, important agenda item, and this covers the changes to the leadership team that were announced yesterday or this morning, depending on your time zone. I'm grateful that we have with us today two of the three system board members of the uh, system board task team um, for this session. We have Alice Ruheza and Neil Gutterson, who are also members of each one of your center boards. With regret, the third team member, Hillary Wild, couldn't join us today due to a longstanding commitment conflict. But we are also joined by Marco Ferroni, the chair of the system board, and I will now hand over to Marco, Alice, and Neil to take us through this topic. Over to you, Marco. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Claudia, and good day to everybody. I trust that you can hear me. And let me first take a moment to recognize and share my appreciation for the tremendous work taking place across CGIER in each of your teams as we all collectively strive to improve the livelihoods of many people on our planet. Some of the, some of the highlights of this that come to mind describing what I know is only part of the collective effort of everyone across CGIER include the launch of CGIER's new global and regional integrated initiatives, the consultations that are being held across regions, partners and countries to strengthen our joint efforts to, towards transformative, really, institution building and co-creation with partners. The work being done to enable CGIR to present to the world a powerful and compelling response to the global food crisis and the efforts to support the transition to operating as a more integrated one CGIR, both by the senior leadership team and many other individuals and teams throughout CGIR. And I know that these are just some of the highlights. Now, to turn to the topic of the day, colleagues, the initial executive management team-led structure with managing directors having equal decision-making authority and appointed for a two-year term was designed to lead CGIR through the initial phases of moving to operate as one CGIR. In line with that approach and around one year ago, the system board started to discuss options for evolving CGIR's top executive management structure. To take this forward, the system board appointed a task team made up of Neil Gutterson, Alice Ruvesa, and Hilary Wild to develop recommendations for a more forward-looking leadership structure. Each of the members of this team brought a wealth of experience to the task. You will be hearing from uh, Hillary and for, sorry, from uh, from uh, the Alice and Neil shortly, uh, and their wealth of experience that they brought to the task included, of course, change management in a, a number of different organizations, including large organizations and many years of executive experience in the public and the private sector. Starting their work in early February of this year, this team designed and executed a robust, I believe, process of consultation to understand stakeholder views on future requirements, 
benchmarking against competitor organizations and key partners, and then testing and challenging the ideas that emerged. Through this process, the task team, again, Lalis, Hillary, and Neil, consulted the full senior leadership team, board chairs, the system council, and many other stakeholders. The task team, at the end of consultation and design steps, provided recommendations for the next phase of CGIR's executive leadership. This process was consultative, as I have described, but the final decision rested with the system board. As we shared yesterday by email and on the CGIR website, Dr. Claudia Serov has been appointed as CGIR's executive managing director, and she will be supported by a revised executive management team that includes herself as EMD and six direct reports. I would like to thank Claudia and congratulate her for agreeing to take on the role of executive managing director. Her consummate leadership skills, her ability to manage adaptively and in a way that brings in diverse perspectives have been greatly appreciated by the system board. Before I hand over to Alice and Neil to talk through more of the details of the announcement, I would add that for the past two years, the efforts to transition how we work and our collective strategic focus have been about ensuring we are fit for purpose to meet the increasingly complex challenges of food security in our era. The changes to the leadership team announced yesterday consolidate this process and set us up for future success. They support a strong focus on science and innovation, on deepening partnership, and on leading evidence-based calls for food, land, and water systems transformation. Our now evolved leadership structure is consistent with organizations of similar size and reach, and very importantly, and thus relevant to the timing of the system board's decision, it is consistent with the recently agreed integrated matrix operational model that was the subject of the earlier part or part of the earlier call, a uh, part of, of your call today, as I understand it. Importantly also, the senior leadership team as a whole maintains its pivotal role as stewards and leaders of a globally dispersed and locally mandated staff. Now with this, let me invite Alice and Neil to talk about the organizational structure in more detail and the process that brought us to, uh, to, to it. And I believe the floor goes to Alice first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. It is my great pleasure to be here with everyone today. As Marco introduced, Neil Gutterson, Hilary Wilde, and I were the three system board members who the system board asked to form a task team to provide recommendations on, next, on the next phase of the leadership team structure. I would like to present the outcomes of the benchmarking consultation and review process the task team undertook to provide our recommendations, which the board endorsed and announced last night. I will also provide a bit more detail on the changes announced. So I want to focus on some of the highlights that emerged from the consultations and shaped our recommendations. Highlights from the responses included a strong support for a model comprising of the following elements. A CEO construct with emphasis that the future selection of the single top executive leader needs to be done right. And as this is a make or break for the future of the CGIR reform. Continuity in a role that focuses on delivery of the transition. Regions and science groups, partnership and resource mobilization efforts should be appropriately represented with some differing perspectives about communications reporting direct to the top executive leader. And lastly, that the apex management should not be larger, a large, at least fewer than 10. So the inputs we received indicated a strong preference for a management structure led by a fully empowered single executive or a CEO type construct. There was strong consensus that an APEC structure supports efficient decision making and provides clarity on who leads the organization. We also had loud and clear that the selection of a future leader needs to be done the right way through a global and competitive recruitment process. We heard about the importance of continuity in the role that focuses on delivery of the transition and that regions and science groups, partnerships and resource mobilization 
be appropriately represented. There was strong feedback that the role of lead executive was a very visible external role that needed to be supported with a strong leader on the operational side and also in terms of communication and outreach. There was also clear consensus that the Apex management team should not be too large, as I mentioned earlier, with fewer than 10 direct reports to the lead executive role. So with that clear input and much additional feedback throughout the consultations and discussions, we arrived at the leadership team structure that was shared yesterday. As you've heard, Claudia has been appointed as the executive management managing director. Congratulations, Claudia. Her appointment ensures much needed continuity and stability during the next phase of the transition. It also provides a supportive environment for extremely constructive and productive engagement from across the entire senior leadership team that we have seen over the past month. Claudia, in her capacity as the EMD, will lead a reconfigured executive management team of six direct reports as part of the senior leadership team. The six direct reports are Sonia Vermullen, uh, Martin Kropf, and Joe Swinen as managing directors for genetic innovation, resilient agri-food systems, and system transformation, respectively. Elwin Granger-Jones as managing director, institutional strategy and systems. Harold Ray McCauley as Managing Director, Regions and Partnerships until his retirement at the end of the, of the year. There will then be a global open and competitive recruitment process to find Harold's successor starting in August. And Lotte Pang as Managing Director, Communications and Outreach. This multidisciplinary EMT is designed to provide the space and facilitation to enable Claudia as EMD to spend more time traveling and on high level engagement with key partners host countries and other governments. The system board welcomes the fact that Elwin has agreed to continue in his role as managing director for institutional strategy and systems. Elwin will continue to play, to play a key internal alignment role, stewarding the one CGI transition. I look forward to working with this tremendous senior leadership team, EMT, and with Claudia in her new role as executive managing director. Thank you very much, and let me hand over to Neil. All right, thank you, Alice. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on the call today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, as a task team lead that provided the recommendations about leadership structure, I wanna provide some more insight into the robust process was that was developed to arrive at the recommendations. And indeed, this was a, a lengthy and robust process. As a task force at the outset, we decided to design the process in a way that would be uh, allow us to um, follow the philosophy of form follows function without any reference to who is in today's roles in the organization in the early stages of the process. Now, given CGR's commitment to diversity and inclusion, we took those aspects as well as the talent that we have in the organization into account as the process uh, proceeded and as the pro proposed structure was fine tuned. Now, if we can just um, have a quick look at uh, the process, I wanna just give you a little feel for um, the steps we took and the nature of the consultation that was involved and that was alluded to previously by Marco and Alice. So this slide summarizes uh, the timeline of the work. I'm not gonna read through it in detail, um, but you can see on the right that the survey that we uh, circulated was issued to 68 recipients in um, late March. Um, included, respondents included many members of the C CGR senior leadership team and a handful of system council members and all system council members received the request and we had a near 50% response rate. Um, and you can see in the left consultation between the task force and the system board, uh, consultation amongst other stakeholders uh, was uh, conducted, um, multiple reviews of um, concepts were, were uh, floated and by June 9th, we had largely uh, agreed on the final proposal. The task force then continued its work, now looking at next steps, socialization of this pro of the uh, new leadership team structure, um, and the review of the communication strategy for the announcement that has now uh, been made, and we are in the middle of that communication plan. Um, you can take down the slide now. Um, as Marco mentioned, I think importantly, we benchmarked against peer organizations, such as FAO and WFP, but we also 
benchmarked across other institutions involved in research, and that included large universities and also the private sector. We also spent a considerable amount of time discussing how we would communicate that news to staff, stakeholders, recognizing that um, we are, of course, a very visible organization, and this is a very important decision for us. So that brings us up to date. Let me just add my congratulations um, to Claudia and my uh, deep appreciation for her agreeing to take on this role of an executive managing director for all of us at the, uh, the CGIR. And, and just add a note that uh, one of the reasons we're all excited about Claudia leading, it, because we've seen her in a, a similar role um, as, a, as the um, facilitator for the EMT and, a, and very much the external voice of the organization We've seen how she manages adaptively. We've seen how she leads consultatively. Um, and that, that culture that she uh, brings, we think, is very important. She's done a great job bringing the senior leadership team together as a critical decision-making body. And we expect that spirit to continue as the senior leadership team continues its important work as a foundation of leadership across the organization. So now back to you, Claudia, and congratulations again. Thank you so much, Marco, Neil, and Alice. Um, let me say again, thank you for the kind words, uh, colleagues in the chat in the Q&A. It really is a tremendous privilege to lead such an extraordinary institution that has such a fundamental mission. And I am truly excited to continue working with all of the incredible colleagues that we have uh, around the world. We do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we don't have anything queued up in the, uh, in the questions right now. So let me speak for a moment in case people would like to put anything in. But if you don't have any questions now, you can always uh, send the questions through the, uh, the form that we have. Uh, we've got in the chat all the various ways that you can provide feedback, uh, questions, anonymously with your name, and we will try to respond to any, uh, any questions, advice, comments that you have. We really are keen to work together as one, to hear, to understand, to adapt, and to move forward really as, as one CG. So I think we will then gift everyone with 15 minutes, which is uh, something we should all enjoy in the summer. Uh, let me add that I, I know <clears throat> we have said this before, and you can see it's taking a toll on, on my voice. We've all been working terribly hard. We've all been uh, putting in all the extra effort that is needed to sustain ourselves under uncertainty and to imagine a way forward with a much more integrated, impactful, influential one CGIR. And we've been working quite a lot. So I hope that for those of you for whom it is summer, for those of you who, for whom it is winter, we will be taking breaks in the coming months, having an opportunity to relax and restore and refresh ourselves uh, to continue the work that we have to do. So let me thank everyone for joining us today, in particular, Marco, Neil, Alice, thank you for your hard work and personally for your, your, your faith in me. Um, and my faith and all the colleagues that we have online today. Again, we welcome your thoughts and suggestions moving forward colleagues through the, the channels that we always have available. And in the meantime, have a great rest of your day, whether it's the evening, afternoon or morning. Take care, be well, and we'll be speaking again soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>